This is a Flying Cow production. Book one, water. Book two, earth. Book three, fire. Long ago, Nickelodeon introduced a series called Avatar The Last Airbender. It combined great anime-style animation, strong storytelling, heart, and humor. It was great, and everyone that saw it loved it. Until one day, a terrible movie came out which everyone hated. But my co-host, Lauren Collins, knows none of this because he's never seen the show. And that's why we are watching every episode of Avatar The Last Airbender, because I believe this could be Lauren's new favorite show. Or at least talk to him. Well, hello, and welcome back to Comets and Cabbages. I, uh, this is, of course, the Avatar The Last Airbender podcast here on The Flying Cow. I, of course, am The Flying Cow, Clay Johnson, and uh, I'm the Boulder's biggest fan. My name's Amanda Van Heil, and without these glasses on, I too would be the blind bandit. <laughs> and I'm Lauren, and I frankly would be excited to get the hippo's autograph. <laughs> All right. Well, yes, we are here, of course, like I said, talking about another episode of Avatar, The Last Airbender. I will say, uh, if you paid attention to the last episode, I made a boo-boo. Um, I said that the next episode was Zuko alone. Well, it's funny because I thought it was Blind Bandit next. And then I yeah. thought, well, maybe this is one of those instances where like a Netflix Blind Bandit comes next. And then like yeah. on another series, like Zuko alone goes next. I mean, I, I haven't rewatched Zuko alone yet. So it honestly could have, because obviously Zuko alone is the continuation of Iroh and right. Zuko's story. Whereas uh, this is the continuation, obviously, of Aang and, uh, Aang and the Gang's story. I, I obviously um, haven't seen it yet. D does, do the regular gang even appear in Zuko alone? See, uh, I can't remember, honestly. I think do, just like, like uh, the, the uh, Zuko doesn't appear in this one, I don't think that they do. So oh, yeah. really, you could switch them and yeah. it wouldn't. You know, affect a whole lot. It would They're just basically be happening you, yeah. You're you're yeah. seeing Zuko's story before you see um, the story of of Ang and the gang. Um, and, yeah, the, you the know, one key, the one key thing would be like even if there's a glimpse of the regular gang, if Toph is in it, then that creates a continuity issue. Sure, but, uh, sure. Yeah. I yeah, I don't I don't think. I mean, obviously, when we watch it next time, we'll know. Yeah. Um, yeah. but. Uh, yeah, we are today talking about the Blind Bandit. Uh, but before we do, we just want to briefly mention the fact that this is the first episode that we are recording after they have uh, indeed uh, decided to renew uh, the live action Avatar um, series on Netflix. Um, and I mean, we talked about it in the last episode. We were talking about the potential for that and now it's confirmed um and you know i'm I, i'm i'm interested to see what they do with the rest of the story you know um they made some very interesting uh choices a lot of which i really liked some of which i did not i will say i do hope that they take some notes and downplay the whole cosplay ishness of it um, because, uh, we're not the only people that, that feel that way. Um, you know, I have a friend, she did not hear us having that conversation and said the exact same note. So I saw a whole thread on it on Twitter. Yeah. It, it looks like cosplay. And so they, they need to dial it back. We don't need a one for one. You can do a, a play and a nod to the series without trying to make it look exact and we'll be fine. We don't need, you know, giant plastic hair on you Um, yeah. it's just unnecessary. Yep. But it is nice too. The Netflix went ahead and, and renewed it. Not just for one more season, but for two. 
<laughs> yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Because, because yeah. you know, we're gonna get the whole thing. Exactly. I mean, I will say a bunch of the articles were like, and a lot of people are disappointed because they're not gonna stretch it out. And I'm like, I don't think anybody was expecting more than three uh, series. I'm like, yeah. I think, I think that's all we ever wanted. I think yeah. we're good. Yeah, I don't know how much material there is in the latter seasons, but unless you were going to yeah. do like a, a Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows well, thing and split, you know, season well, three and two seasons. Especially because they brought a lot of the stuff up in season two, yep. up to season one. So I'm kind of interested to see, you know, I mean, yes, a, a lot of those were from episodes that weren't necessarily, weren't necessarily important to the plot. So it was a nice way to fit them in, in different ways. But, you know, some of that stuff, it's just like, oh, okay, so what are we going to do in the place where we would have introduced that thing? It's just going to be there. Okay, interesting. Um, but, you know, we, we, will, we will see, and I am interested to see. I am curious. But like I said, um, I cannot see this happening uh sooner than two years the next i think season? there's no yeah there's no way we get it um sooner than two years um just because the the only thing that has been said is that they had already started writing yeah oh. i mean i yes i understand that they had all of the other pre-production stuff in place yep. so they won't have to like but they're still gonna have to film and from what they said post took almost a year yep so well, if uh depends on the netflix release model i i suppose if, if they, well, they release all at once in with like the strain the last stranger things season where you split it in two sure. i could i could imagine them like they have a year they could knock out right four episodes of a show in a year and then have a little more time you know and put out the next four episodes like three months later four months later um what Honestly, I miss the model of like a new episode a week. I don't yeah, like. I was about to say, I, to I wish yet. Netflix is the only one that still dumps, and well, I uh, really some wish of them on a case by case basis. But yeah, I mean, there are a couple that will dump like two or three episodes, like when like Disney Plus often will oh, dump uh, the first two or three episodes, oh, but no, then but after that, Disney it's like, one like, at a time. But they dropped all of Echo ju just like two months ago, all, all at once. All of it? At all the same? It. I I thought they were doing that week to week. Nope that that was one of the controversies over Echo was that Disney had pretty re mostly reliably done week to week. I mean, I I will say yeah. though, um, like I said, they often dump the first three. That one yeah. only had five episodes, didn't it? Um, was it just five? Yeah. I, I mean, yeah. They, so they that might be why. All it's like Muppets Mayhem. They had done uh, th that all at once. Also, like they right. they'd done, you know, Obi Wan with six episodes week to week. That you yeah know? yeah. That Boba Fett was I think six episodes, and it was week to week. Yeah, um, I don't I don't know. I I just I I know that Netflix is the only one that consistently consistent. No, you're absolutely right about consistently. That's true. Yeah yeah. Um, but and I really wish honestly with this show, I think I would have enjoyed it more week to week. Um, oh yeah, but. You know, I'm, and then I mean, maybe it, you guys would have had a little more time to watch it. <laughs> yes, no, it, it, it is a it is a show about a journey. It would make sense yeah. for this to, be, to to build. Yeah, take a take the Sounds audience like on a journey. Have a case of destination fever. <laughs> <laughs> it's all about the journey, man. All right, all right. Well, uh, speaking of the journey, let's get on ours. Uh, we are, like I said, today talking about uh, the episode of Avatar, The Last Airbender, um, entitled The Blind Bandit. It was directed by Ethan Spaulding and written by Michael Dante DiMartino, one of our creators, which I don't think we've had an episode written by either one of them. Well, okay, so the water bending master, um, the, um, you know, one of the final episodes of season one, was written by um, Michael Dante Di Martino, but it's it's been a bit, 
um, since then. So, uh, and I, I imagine this was a rather important episode to them. So I understand why one of them decided to write it. Um, but yeah, it also, um, it debuted April, sorry, May 5th, um, 2006. Uh, and you know, this episode is basically the culmination of kind of the journey that they have been on the entire beginning of this season. Aang has been looking for an earthbending master ever since the episode. Well, I mean, really since uh, the the first episode of this season, because of originally they thought it was Boomy, but then ever since, uh, you know, Boomy basically said, no, I'm going to choose to stay in prison. Uh, they uh, have been looking for a new master for Aang, and we finally um, meet uh, that uh, master in the character of Toph. Um, and so this is the episode that introduces the character of Toph. And Amanda, I have to ask you, um, because I know... You know, you said, you know, obviously you more recently uh, watched the series, but you said you've kind of been watching it on and off ever since then. Mm -hmm. um, so for me, uh, every time I rewatch this, at a certain point, there's always like the anticipation. It's like, oh, yeah, kind of just waiting to get to Toph again. Yeah. <laughs> It's like the, like this is one of those episodes that it's like I enjoy a lot of the stuff that comes before it, but there's also like a feeling like the it's not the show yet until yeah. Toph gets. No, I get it. It's like because when I go and watch, I'm like, this one's a fun one, Ugh, but Toph's not there. Like yeah. Secret Tunnel, like I love Secret Tunnel, but Toph's not there. Yeah. Yes. When are we gonna get to the fireworks factory? <laughs> the the fireworks factory. Oh, did, did either y'all get that reference? No. Oh, it's an old Simpsons thing. Oh, okay. Okay, I okay. kind of recognize it. I feel like Dan's probably said it a million yeah, times. Yeah, it's, it's, I, it's, it's, I grew up in a conservative religious house, so I was never allowed to watch The Simpsons, and I've only seen bits and pieces since then. Yeah, so. it's it's somewhat the inverse of this. But but yeah, it's, it's the Poochie episode, where Itchy and Scratchy are driving down the highway to the fireworks factory, and then when they're like half a mile from it, then the episode just stops at its tracks to introduce Poochie, who just dominates <laughs> the speed, and they, okay. and they never get... And uh, Millhouse complains. It's just like, when are they going to get to the fireworks factory? <laughs> never, never. Um, I will say though, uh, Lauren, you being this your first time mm -hmm. watching, obviously you have heard of Toph. Yep. You you hinted as, as much uh, in the uh, swamp episode. Um, but uh, did this character stick out to you immediately, or was it just kind of like, okay, I'm interested? to see after this why everybody's on about top no for, for the episode as a whole she certainly did um i did mm -hmm. not clock in her immediate introduction you know in the fight that it was tough because i didn't know anything about top i didn't know well Toph. they I mean, because they tough. call her the blind bandit the whole time and well, no, uh, but, I, but I, I, I did not know before this episode top was going to be blind for right instance. exactly i heard the name i knew she was a little girl that's yeah uh did i i'm not sure i knew she was a little girl at least on the swamp like sure. um yeah, because uh, that that at least I got gave me a visual depiction. Yeah, um, but uh, but no, as as a, as an overall introduction, it was strong for the character, uh, intriguing yeah. for the future. I did have, for what it's worth, some some small qualms with some of the logic behind you know her backstory. <laughs> um okay. but that, we'll that's there. forgivable. Yeah, we'll get there. But that that's yeah. that's forgivable for the the the, the nature of this show. I sure. think. Uh, but no, a, a strong introduction. Uh, I have a feeling when we get to the end and do our little segments that we will be hearing Toph's name a lot. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Um, but yeah, uh, you know, I, I think this is a, this is a fun episode, so let's go ahead and let's jump into it. Uh, so, uh, like I said, they are, uh, Aang and the gang arrive in, you know, an area of the Earth King Kingdom, and they see... Uh, kind of, uh, um, you know, advertisements for an earthbending academy. And Aang decides to to check it out. 
Uh, come to find out, it's basically, and I will say, I like this touch because before this, it's it's all like, you know, when we see vendors, it it's very like old school kind of setup, like students and masters. Like it it seems more like uh, older traditionals sort of setup, whereas this seems like you know more modern like your uh taekwondo class that's uh in a strip mall you know kind kind of set up uh like it 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 feels like that type of thing and i was like honestly that makes sense that there would be you know capitalist uh vendors that are you know teaching their bending style uh, as a way of making money and you know, what? you know, good for them. <laughs> yeah, I mean, honestly, for the most part, I'm like, I don't think there's anything wrong with that model. <laughs> Obviously, this master, uh, I can't remember, I keep thinking his name is like Master Doe or something, but I, I do you guys remember Master-Pledo. his name? <laughs> master, Master Hugh, Master Hugh, that's what it yep. is. Um, but he's obviously just driven by money yeah. you know and it's like oh okay because you know uh after ang just gets pummeled with rocks he's like do you want to sign up for the full the 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 full session and you know all this kind of thing money 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 um so it's like okay and and obviously ang is like yeah i don't think this is the guy for me yeah. um but while they're there <laughs> excuse me while they're there, they do hear about, you know, a uh, competition that is going to be happening soon um, between Earthbenders. Uh, it is called Earth Rumble Six, which immediately I'm like, okay, we're going to do a play on, pl- on pro wrestling. Yeah. I mean, I don't know how you take anything else from that. Uh, th- from that title it's like obviously that's that's what we're getting into i will say you know at first we just hear these guys talking about it and but they walk away and so they're like what was that and katara's like i'll find out and she comes comes back like just with the information she's like i got us tickets to earth rumble six and all this kind of stuff and we're like just like okay that's that's fun but uh little do we know uh how Katara actually got that information. Um, she kind of uh, beat it out of these two guys. Uh, yep. And they end up in this precarious situation. I like to think she full on mugged them and took their lunch money and ran too. Yeah. I mean, I would imagine that she was probably like, hey, hey guys. And they were just like dismissive assholes to her. Yep. And that's when she, you know, was like, you know what? No, I, I've, I, I took it from, I've, I took it from my brother. I, I took this attitude from Master Paku. No, you guys are idiots. Done. That's what I like to think she done. So, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Not taking this shit from you. <laughs> um, be yeah. So you know they are, uh, you know, I, that that uh, picture didn't show it, but they're basically um vertically on uh, opposing walls uh together with their head it's it, it's insane i'm just like i don't even know how you engineered this guitar but it's great i love it I, um for example where did you get the water from honestly <laughs> well i mean she she's always got that little pouch that's exactly yes but the operative word there is little <laughs> like yeah, I mean, Katara is a resource. Can stretch girl. that water out yeah. for quite oh, no, when, a while. When, when I turn yeah. water into ice, it only really goes so far. <laughs> it's a it technicality. The same about I, I was about to say. We don't I'm know thinking, the physics work the same way there. Yeah, the, there might have been a bucket somewhere. I, I believe it. I don't care. There's a um, yeah. I'll go. I'll go with the with the story there. Sure. sure. Um, but uh, they do. They go to Earth Rumble Six. And I will say, I just, I love this depiction of this kind of uh, pro wrestling style, uh, earthbending kind of setup that they have. Um, 
someone in the room obviously must have pitched the name like Bending Mania Six or something like that. Is, uh, is it? Oh, I'm, I'm sure. I'm sure that there one. were other. Uh, I, I think Earth Rumble Six. Earth, Earth Rumble Six pretty is good. good. It does. It is pretty, pretty good. good. Yeah. Um, I will say I'm I I'm interested in why they chose six um, as opposed oh. to, you know, any other number. I do wonder if because, you know, obviously, you know, at least somebody was familiar with with pro wrestling. Obviously. I'm wondering if maybe because for anybody that does know um, a WrestleMania six is where the un, the um, uh the ultimate warrior fought, fought Hulk Hogan. Ah. So maybe that, I mean, and, and it was a big WrestleMania at the time. Yeah. So maybe uh, it was a reference to that, except that we don't really have a character that is reminiscent of either one of those two. Yeah. So no, I don't I know, know. It, 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 if, if that was a particularly <laughs> significant WrestleMania, then that would be yeah. a reason for the, the reference as opposed yeah. to, because honestly, I would normally think, oh, this is an event in the Avatar universe. I'm surprised there's only six. Like, like the, sure. this should have been going on for decades, honestly, at this point. Well, and, and honestly, like my point was, you know, we've got a character coming up, the bold, the boulder yes. that is obviously reminiscent of the rock. So yes. I'm like, you know, I'm like, you know, why didn't they choose like, you know, 17 or, you know, uh, 19 or, you know, uh, 15, any one of the ones that he was in. Um, but you know, wh whatever, whatever. I'm not going to quibble over rock, it. Though, in the live action. <laughs> I mean, you know, uh, he, here's the thing. Like I said, we have this character, the boulder. Obviously, he was named after the rock. From what I have heard, this is kind of hearsay, but uh, they originally reached out to the rock. Mm -hmm. But, I mean, this was... I mean, this was before his like six? real calling was family programming. Yeah, I mean, honestly, this was he was uh, he he was Those in six. movie roles and things yeah. things like that. But it still had not gotten mostly to the point of action where the best, movies. He's best at is doing like stuff. For, well, like, and I will say also this is around the time you know there was a point at which he kind of just stepped away from the wrestling completely. Oh, okay. Um, to kind of build his his movie career, and yeah. so maybe this was, you know, maybe it was from his point of view a little smaller than he wanted to do. Maybe it was too reminiscent of wrestling. But either way, instead of The Rock, they got another pro wrestler, actually a friend of The Rock, yeah. Mick Foley, to voice uh, the Boulder and. I absolutely love Mick Foley. He is uh, a tremendous character, one of my uh, favorite performers within the realms of professional wrestling. And so to have him provide the voice here was just really, really fun. Um, yeah, that, that's really the enjoyed thing that. you could hope to get for a, a guest voice. If you'd been, if they'd yeah. been doing this like five years earlier, they might have been able to get The Rock back when well, he was like. Doing a guest star appearance on Star Trek. Yeah, yeah. If they had, like, in 2001, something yeah. like that, you know, they might have been able to get him. But Oh, yeah, yeah. like, I'm sorry, he, I, he did a Voyager episode in 2000. So, like, yeah, that, yeah. That at kind of at like, this point, yeah, he's, he's, he's stepping yeah. away. But what I find entertaining, like I said, not only do our uh, Mick Foley and The Rock friends, but there was a point at which they were working together uh, on screen in in kayfabe in storyline and the uh mick foley would basically do uh, a played down version of the rock stuff so like yep. where the rock would say and the millions and millions of the rocks fans and um foley would be like and and the, the hundreds and tens of the of Mick Foley's fans like just totally play down all of that kind of stuff. And so to see him once again kind of playing into the rock shtick was yeah. really kind of fun. It's funny looking um, at the Avatar uh wiki, like it mentions the boulder being the rock, it mentions yeah. Fire Nation man being a heel stereotype. It does not Oh yeah. Yeah. Oh that 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 is that is straight up like um Nikolai Volkov. 
yeah. type type of uh, of uh, setup. The Fire Nation Ned or whatever his name is. Yeah, yeah. It surprises me though. It does not mention the hippo's inspiration because that one stood out to me, and I don't like. I don't know. Uh, I mean. But, you know, I, I will say I think the the hippo is probably an amalgamation of a bunch of different, like maybe King Kong Bundy a little bit, no, maybe. Like, he's, um, he's, I, I, unless I am wildly mistaken here, he's he's not a a reference to a like human wrestler. He's a reference to King Hippo from Mike Tyson's Punch Out. Oh, okay. Yeah, I mean, well, he's, he's modeled right it's after. A, it's he a fighting to, game. It's a fighting game. He does the yeah. same kind of poses. He has the same sort of weird hippo teeth. And that, that yeah. probably is exactly where it's from. Yeah. But no, yeah. like the, the wiki does not mention that, which I find fascinating. Yeah. Well, they were probably looking for pro wrestling um, correlations yeah. and uh, didn't find, find it there. So, yeah. Um, but yeah, so um, the setup for uh, Earth Rumble 6 is that uh, at least from what I remember, is that the Boulder was the champion, but lost the championship and is now basically trying to regain it. But in order to do so, he has to go through basically a gauntlet of other competitors in order to just face the champ. And so that is kind of the setup. I will say it is Sokka is having an absolute ball. I love how this. he and gets I, into it like so quickly. I I love the type of fan that Sokka is because it's yeah. just absolutely ridiculous. He's over the top, and I'm like, yeah, that's that's the that's a fun type of type of wrestling fan. Like that's, I mean, yeah, he gets a little overboard with it and can be a little hateful without realizing what Go he's what he's saying, which is. Yeah, which is once again a typical wrestling fan uh, <laughs> type of thing. Um, but you know he's um, doing all, all of this, and um, we're going through all of the competitors. And I will say, the Boulder fights a lot of people. Like they show like three or four like matches, and then they go through a montage of like six more. And I'm just like, my God, that is ins an insane number of matches for one man just to get to uh, the champion. And when they bring out the champion, they announce the champion as the blind bandit. And out comes this tiny little girl. And, you know, if you are watching the video, you have seen, and if you've seen the, the episode, you, you know, the boulder is, you know, looks like a typical pro wrestler, gigantic, massive physique, all of this stuff. And who comes out but this tiny little girl um, to uh, face them and... You know, uh, I mean, when she holds up the championship, it's almost bigger than she is. Um, and you can also, uh, if you're once again watching and you know what she looks like, uh, you can tell this character either has the lightest eyes ever or she's blind. Um, and so it's just like, what are we doing here? <laughs> What's going on? And of course, the boulder has has the line of, you know, the boulder is conflicted about fighting the little girl. And of course, Toph, ever the, yeah, I'm not what you think I am. You know, sounds like you're scared, whatever she says. Um, and he's hell? just like, yeah, he's just like, the boulder's no longer conflicted. Let's do this. <laughs> Um, but you know, uh, I will say, you know, from, from that point on in this, um, we see, uh, kind of the way that Toph, um, experiences the world through the vibrate at, at you will notice that Toph does not wear shoes. She's always barefoot. Um, and, um, you know, the the reason for that is given in the fact that that's how she sees. She is able to see th through earth bending, through the vibrations that she's feeling in the earth with her feet, um, 
to the point where these other competitors have absolutely no chance. Just no chance because the moment that they make a um you know a move towards her you know she uh instantly is able to uh destroy them basically uh and i you know obviously ang realizes that this is you know what uh boomy was talking about about finding a master who waits and listens but what i find really interesting about it and i guess i never really thought about it before is that she has to wait she has to listen so this is a competitor no matter how good she is she has to let the other person make the first move you know i i obviously a lot of you know uh people will will tell you i mean you know I obviously martial arts is as a form meant for defense. And so most people will tell you, you never make the first move. You wait for your opponent to make the first move. Um, but here's a character who has to, because otherwise she doesn't know where they are. Um, but it's, it's just kind of like showing that this character is the epitome of what Aang needs. I mean, uh, obviously, Amanda, you have a little bit more of martial art e experience. Can you add any, um, you know, uh, of your expertise to this? <laughs> I was never an expert. Um, <laughs> she, so a lot of it is sensitivity and being able to feel what your opponent is doing. Um, sometimes like as they're getting ready. So being able to feel just the slightest of when they're about to like strike a certain, certain direction. So that is what she has mastered is the patience and focus of martial yeah. arts the part that I'm really bad at. <laughs> <laughs> so you need some lessons from Toph. Is what I would saying. need a lot of lessons from Toph. Yes. <laughs> awesome. Yeah. So yeah, she beats, uh, she beats the boulder. Uh, yeah. the, the, the ring master puts up a challenge. Aang takes the ring and wins. Yeah. Yeah. Well, because Aang does not need to, uh, move on the ground, on the ground because exactly. he's, he's an airbender. Um, and so, uh, he is you know, uh, yeah. Aang this whole time has just been, you know, once he realizes what she is yep. and makes the correlation of the, the girl in the swamp. He wants to meet her, but by beating her immediately, she wants to have nothing to do with him. So uh, they have to find a way to track her down. Um, they do see the guys at the um, the uh, Earthbending Dojo again. And I will say I'm mentioning this mostly because I forgot to mention the last time that one of them is voiced by Scott Menville. Did you of guys clock that? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I don't know their names, so I can't tell you which one, but he's one of them. Um, yeah. But yeah, they uh, basically, uh, Katara, you know, scares them into sharing their information. And uh, eventually, based more actually on uh, Aang's uh, siding at the swamp with the flying boar, they're like, well, you know, we don't know where the blind bandit is, but this flying boar, that's the symbol of the Beifong family. They live, you know, such and such place. And, you know, on their way out, of course, Katara, Katara has to reassert her, her dominance. Because, I mean, honestly, the, these guys, they're, they're kind of assholes. So I'm not, I don't feel bad about it. But I will say there is something about this little bit, mostly uh, the way that uh, Sokka uh, finishes it off that I've always kind of oddly liked. So I just want to take a look at this. Hey. I got my eye on you. Water tribe. I don't know what it is, but that little water, water tribe. The, the fact that it's whispered is, is part of what makes it. Yes. Well, and also the way that he does his hands where he just like oh, slides yeah. them out away from his body. I'm just like, it's, it's, don't get me wrong. It is dorky as fuck. Yes. But it's also like, kind of like a cool version of dorky. Like it's, yes. it's just like, honestly, I, I would have no problem doing that as I leave every room. 
There was a thing that <laughs> because he has the confidence to do it. Exactly. Exactly. That's what it is. Yeah. There was something they said in there that it confused me for the moment because I thought they said like the Bayfongs don't have a daughter. And then Right. It, but then they very clearly do. It's not like they're keeping her a secret. She's just they are. They mm -hmm. they're keeping her a secret from the world. They yeah, are because keeping her, the only they people that know she exists. They want to keep her safe. Yeah, the only people that know she exists are their parents and yep. uh, Master Yu, um, who is, okay. is teaching her. But yeah, no, uh, I mean, I will say it's not made super explicit yep. um, because like they don't they don't hide her from Aang or anything like that. Yep. But they do mention a couple of times we kept her a secret from the world. Um, you know, the, the, the Bayfongs don't have a daughter. They are basically, she doesn't leave the compound. Yeah. As, as so far as they know. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Which it, honestly it is why she is able to be the blind bandit, because if yeah. she wasn't kept a secret and people yeah. knew what she looked like, everybody would know who she was. Yeah. She's not in disguise or anything, but she, she yeah. is pulling like an early Peter Parker and sneaking off to be in a wrestling competition. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. But yeah, they do. They track her down. And, um, you know, the moment Aang sets foot in um, uh, on the grounds, she knows it's him and immediately is just like, you know, get out of here and calls the guards on them and everything. But Aang is insistent to talk to Ta. So uses his celebrity basically to get an audience with her parents and they have dinner. And I will say, I don't know about you guys, but I loved this dinner scene where Toph is just constantly kicking the shit out of Aang <laughs> with <laughs> earth bending. I mean, Aang gets like one air blast, which honestly attacks everybody at the table, not just Toph. Um, and I, I love that nobody says anything about that. It's just like, oh, okay, you just air blasted all of us. I guess that's just, you know, comes with uh, hanging out with the Avatar. Um, but uh, I love how Toph just keeps mercilessly, you know, hitting him with rocks and crap, uh, <laughs> trying to keep him from, you know, spilling her secret, basically. Um, but, you know, we get in this... Uh, set up, we get this picture of uh, Toph's parents. They really don't know their daughter at all. They just see her size, her frailty, her blindness, and just assume that they have to keep her away and safe from the whole world, that that's the only way that she will be safe kind of thing. And, you know, ob so obviously they don't know that not only is she a badass but she's also snarky as hell um so you know obviously like i said they don't know their daughter at all um but uh you know um trying to remember uh how this transitions uh do they um after the dinner is this can you guys? Oh no, no, no! I know that um, Ang and Toph ha have a conversation. Um, oh, that's right. Ang and Toph have a conversation, and the Boulder has convinced uh, Shin Fu, the guy that ran the uh, Earth bending, uh, the uh, Earth Rumble Six, that they had to be in collusion because uh, Ang never Earth bended. He never uh, did anything, and so and she just fell off. So she had to have taken a dive. Obviously, they're not uh, assuming that Aang's an airbender. Um, so, uh, yeah, they go after both of them and, um, you know, kidnap them. And so they're seeking ransom money from Toph's parents. Um, but then uh, okay, when they get those autographs, though, <laughs> they, yeah. they, they do get the boulders autograph. Yes. Um, well, so I can, what autograph. I love is they send a ransom note oh. and then they sign it. Yeah. What the what the hell, guys? No one said they were smart. No. <laughs> but I'm just like, uh, why don't you guys send this to the authorities? Not, you know, just go pay the ransom. They just confessed to kidnapping. 
for crying out loud. Um, but um, yeah, I mean, like like you said, Sokka is very excited about having the boulders autograph. I love that even after the boulder reveals himself to be kind of shady and underhanded, uh, Sokka, like a true wrestling fan, won't accept it and is just lost in his fandom. Um, but uh, you know, uh you know, they uh when they go to collect Toph, they reveal that well, we're just gonna keep the uh the avatar and turn him into the fire nation, which I'm just like, you guys are in the earth kingdom. What? Wow, you guys are really just out for yourselves, type of thing. <laughs> um, but um, you know, Katara and Sokka call oh. on Toph to help them. And, of course, her dad is just like, she's tiny and helpless and blind. She can't help you. And Toph's just like, shut up, dad. Yes, I can. Um, she doesn't say shut up, dad, but I really wish she had. Um, but, yeah, she goes and she helps. And um, there are some really cool fight sequences where she and Aang work together to take this stuff out. And I know that in the past we have said that often – you know, Bender versus Bender has not been the most interesting uh, fights. A lot of times the non-Bender Bender fights are more interesting. I will say, though, I think that Toph is definitely the exception, especially with this kind of like sonar ability that we're seeing her use. I find that fascinating every single time I see it. Um, you know, especially when it's like they make one move with their feet and they're done uh, kind of thing. But um, she takes them all, all out, and, you know, they're both saved. Um, and how does uh, her dad respond to seeing that her his daughter can take care of herself and that she's got this secret life and everything like that? No, you know, good for you, no respect, no nothing. Just we need to do a better job of keeping you away from the world. Yep. Wow, Dad, you learned nothing from this. <laughs> Absolutely nothing. You're really not paying attention, are you? Um, and uh yeah, um basically decides to double down on keeping her away from the world and banishes the avatar from his house. Um, and so uh it looks like Aang and the gang are about to leave dejected without an earth bending master. Um, but then Toph, uh, runs up and is like, my dad changed his mind and I don't believe her for a second. Nope. <laughs> Did any of you guys? Absolutely not. No, nope. no, 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 of course not. And of course they're like, awesome, let's go. And immediately we cut to a scene with, with her dad. That's like the avatar has kidnapped my daughter. And I'm just like, oh, geez. Yeah. Oh, uh, of course you go to that and not my daughter re feels repressed. And so she ran away. No, the avatar, like he just refuses to accept the reality of the situation and only sees what he wants to see. Yeah, it probably wouldn't have hurt at all if Toph had left behind a note explaining like, I'm not being kidnapped. Like, well, he, not here, like she can Here's the it. thing. <laughs> uh, it's true. <laughs> that's, a, that's a good point. If, yeah. if her parents, if her parents have not taught her to be literate, they really have dropped the ball here. It's... I mean, you know, they they but honestly, I, honestly I'm surprised left her illiterate because. Well, that I'm, I'm just... surprised that she has an earthbending instructor at all. Yeah, yeah. Like the fact that they even allow her, because you know this this guy. First of all, this guy's an idiot because. She is somehow convincing him that she can only do basic forms. Yes. Really? Wow. Yeah. That 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 I, I mentioned at the top that that I had certain issues with the logic of the episode, and one of the big part of that is just I don't understand why she would want to hide it. Why she's gone to this effort to fake that she does not know it? Because well, her, I mean, I will say at this point, that, it is if if her parents knew. I mean, obviously, you know, they are just holding tighter. So I think that she she obviously in every other um yeah. uh 
situation um, plays exactly how her parents see her. So I think that there might have been a time where she tried to show, which might have been why they um, agreed to let her have an earthbending master. But I think that she tried to show that she had ability or that she was more than what they see her as, but realized that she's never going to get through to her parents. So realizes that it's best to just play the game. She might have an earthbending master because they found she could earthbend and they were worried that she would hurt herself. So she needed to have someone to teach her how to do it safely so she doesn't accidentally earthbend herself. Sure. But yeah, keep, keeping it a secret allows her to have the freedom that she does. Yeah. And, and yes, you, you can sort of no prize your way into a rough rationalization here. But like right. within the con, what we do see in the episode is that one, the one person they have out for outside person they've disclosed her existence to is a master who they brought in to train her. Mm-hmm. And they, like they say at dinner, they're kind of disappointed. Like she hasn't made any more progress than she has. Like they, they won't, they clearly won't. I, to I don't think that it's they like, were disappointed. It was more just like how she'd been doing. And yeah. he's like, B- ma- basic forms. And I think yeah. they more say something like, well, we don't want to rush it kind of thing. Yeah. I don't think that they're upset by her progress at all. If anything, I think they're upset that she's made progress. Yeah. But again, that doesn't make any sense to br- bring someone in. It, again, if, if it's a matter of protecting your safety, they could honestly, have the line. That's why I, I cool. think I think that uh, Amanda hit the nail on the head. I think yeah. that they just want to make sure that she's not going to hurt herself with her own abilities. Yeah. By the way, um, is at what is, is has it ever been established at what age someone starts demonstrating bending ability normally? No, I mean, I, I mean, will say kids that can do it. Yeah, the old, the old X Men thing obviously is like kind of when you hit puberty, more or less. Right. I but mean, I will say it's network. definitely because you know, obviously, Ang ha- is only twelve and is an Airbending yeah. master. Yeah. So I will say, um, you know, we'll we'll see later in other series, um, yeah. vendors showing it as early as like five. Yeah. So, um, you know, it might even um, come out a little earlier than that. I would say probably as soon as they're able to walk, they might start demonstrating. That's um, my guess. Or like if they're trying to reach for water and then the water moves, it's like, oh, well, that kid's a bender. Yeah, exactly. But but boy, but doesn't it have to be particular forms in order to make stuff happen? Um, I I mean, in in order, in order to make like certain actions happen, but just to show that they have, uh, any sort of sway over the element at all, like it, Mm -hmm. it would just, you know, hesitate or, you know, just kind of rise and fall kind of thing. Um, yeah. Um, but, but yeah, the kind uh, kind of stuff we saw as the test in the live action movie when it's like, here's a rock. Yeah. Uh, the rock yeah. shapes, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, I will say something that I forgot to mention is that in this episode, we get the first um, the first time that uh, Toph refers to Aang as Twinkle Toes, which will basically become her nickname for, for him from for Forever. the rest of the series. <laughs> yeah. Um, in fact, I'm pretty sure she qual- calls him Twinkle Toes more than she does Ang. Um, but uh, yeah, is there anything else about this episode that we want to mention before oh, we move yeah. on? Yeah, so the actress that plays Toph, she played Mang, the one that called Katara Floozy. That oh yeah 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 that's right. And I I can't believe that I did this, but um, do want to mention so the actress that plays Toph. Um, oh geez, why can I not find this? Um, the a- actress that plays Toph, um, during the years that this was on, went by the name of Jesse Flower. Um, now though, apparently she is going by her real name. That was just a stage name. Her real name is Michaela Jill Murphy. And I will say she is doing, um, a lot of, uh, like a YouTube series right now where she is rewatching um the the show uh and the first time that i saw one of her her videos it said michaela jill murphy the voice of toff 
And I was like, uh-uh, because that's Jesse Flowers. Did not realize it was the same person. <laughs> yeah, I got so confused on that at first. Yeah, yeah. I'm just like, okay. But yeah, it makes sense because um, she was a kid at the time. So it makes sense that right. they gave her like a stage name. Right, right. Um, but yeah, she's she's still working, um, has done... Um, oh, apparently she started in Finding Nemo. Oh. Um, played, uh, um, you know, little minor voices in the background, fish and baby turtles, things like that. Um, also, oh, she also played one of the the little girl in Kronk's New Groove. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, um, yeah, you know, uh, still a voice actor, still doing. Oh, she was also the young voice of uh franny in uh, meet the robinsons so she's done a bunch a bunch of stuff bunch a bunch of stuff and uh mm -hmm. obviously most famously toth mm -hmm. um but yeah anything else that we want to mention i'm glad i'm glad we mentioned that that's very important um, no, yeah. nothing else at all no. all right well then let us go ahead and let us move to our first uh, segment, which is, of course, our My Cabbages, cabbages. moment, which is, of course, the part where we talk about our favorite or most interesting scene for the episode. Um, uh, let's see, Amanda, we're going to start with you. What was your My Cabbages moment? Sokka at Earth Rumble 6. Just how much he got into it, especially with like the Fire Nation guy. It's so much fun. It is so much fun. I I will say that whole Earth Rumble 6 sequence is uh like so much fun. I would be surprised if all of our scenes don't come from elements of that yeah. somewhere. But we'll see. We'll see. Um, but yeah, no, that Sokka, Sokka being a ridiculous wrestling fan is, yeah, it's, it's a lot of fun. Uh, Lauren. Uh, on the other end of the episode, uh, I, I know I've been down on some of the fight sequences in the past. We alluded to that earlier, but this yeah. last big fight scene, uh, I think benefited from having, uh, on the one side, a, a team of different characters. Like it's yes. not just a one-on-one, -on -one, you're just throwing stuff at each other. Yeah. But you had a variety of people, each with sort of different shticks, you know, yeah. they're, they're bringing to them from the, the, the bending wrestling championship um, up against what amounts to a super powered version of Daredevil. Um, <laughs> who, who's having to use her very, very different skills against them. So it was, mm -hmm. it was a very different dynamic for the fight and uh, a lot more entertaining as a result. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. So I, I guess I was right when I pointed that out about that fight. It, it was pretty interesting. Yep. Um, uh, yeah, mine, honestly, I just really love seeing the uh, Toph sonar scenes, especially that first one against the boulder where he's all like posturing and everything. And she just hears his heel hit the floor and immediately sends it off in the other direction and causes him to like do the splits. <laughs> like that bit that whole thing where she just owns him like with with zero effort i yeah i'm i i i thought that was that was amazing that that was uh definitely my favorite scene for this episode um so now it is time for our mako award this is of course the award that we give to our favorite or most interesting character for uh, the episode. So, Lauren, um, who gets your Mako Award? All right. So, I sat on this for a bit because I'm really torn between Fire Nation Man or the Hippo. Um, okay. And eventually, I came down to it's tall. It's, uh, I, yeah, it's gonna be tall. That's fine. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I I I will say honestly, I really liked the touch of Fire Nation Ned, um, yeah. because. N number one, um, it is straight up a salute to characters like the Iron Sheik. I think specifically Nikolai Volkov, because Nikolai Volkov did the bit of coming to the ring with the Russian flag, singing the 
quote unquote Russian national anthem. It was never the Russian national anthem. Oh yeah, then that was that's a random yeah. song that he sang. But Fire Nation Ned does the same thing where he okay. sings a made up song about the Fire Nation. Yeah. Um, no, but I, I wasn't like, familiar with his shtick, but but yeah, if once you got to the fake national anthem, no, yeah. you're absolutely right. That's who that it, is. Yeah, but it it's also I think really funny that this guy come out. Fire Nation Ned, he's an Earthbender. Is it Ned? I it Fire Nation <laughs> I'm man. pretty sure it's Ned. I mean, I I might be wrong. Somebody can correct me. You okay. guys, if you guys look it up and it's wrong, let me know. Um, but yeah, I'm pretty sure it is. But either way, I, I that I just thought was funny. So yeah, I uh, I, I appreciated that. Um, Amanda. Uh who gets your uh, Mako award? Okay, so it's easy to say Toph, but because Toph is in a whole bunch of them, I'm not going to give it to her just because I want to give it to her in the future. And mm -hmm. I only have so many instances to give it to the boulder. So I'm going to give it to the boulder. <laughs> Amanda, you like read me like a book uh, <laughs> because I'm doing the exact same thing. Uh, once again, Toph, great character. And I think this is a pretty good introduction of her but we're gonna get so much more tough goodness and sass and snark and we got a bit of it in this episode but you we have not really seen. good stuff later i was about to say you have not in fact i'm thinking about an episode that's coming up that i'm like i'm pretty sure i'm gonna give it to Toph in that episode yeah. but um for this one i mean I got to give it to Mick Foley for crying out loud. I mean, it's just, I mean, his ridiculous uh, rock impression referring to himself in the third person and just for being Mick Foley. I, I yeah, I got to, I got to give it to Mick Foley as the boulder. Just, just so much, so much fun. Um, but yeah, now it is time to rate the episode on the Avatar State Meter. We can give it anywhere from a one to a four, five being the highest, the show at full power, one, the lowest could deal it a fatal blow. So, um, Amanda, um, where do you land on this, um, what do you, uh, give this episode, the blind? Oh, Bandit. this one's a great one. It's getting a four and a half. All right. All right. Lauren. Um, I really enjoyed it. I'm going to give it a four. All right. Jeez. Oh, um, I, I mean, it, it's ridiculous because I'm really literally just wrestling between a four and a four and a half. Um, but four you know what? I, I think I think I am going to give this a four point five um, because it's just. You know, it is a very important episode, but it's also a very fun episode, but it also, you know, it sets up a lot. I mean, I, I think I hinted at it, but I didn't uh, outright say it, you know, um, Toph's parents or dad specifically basically entrust the uh, Earth Rumble 6 guy and the, the, the uh, promoter and um, her old master, Master Yu. Uh, to go after uh, Toph. So, you know, they're basically, they've got a couple of people on their tail now from this episode going forward. So it sets up some stuff, also sets up Toph as um, Aang's uh, earthbending master. So some very important stuff. <clears throat> really interesting. Uh, so, and, you know, introduces a very important character and just, yeah. Just great, great stuff. Four and a half. Um, but uh, yeah, um, want to let everyone know now how they can get into contact with us. So, of course, you can contact me at the Flying Cow Pod on Twitter and Instagram. Um, make sure to, you can also um, email at the Flying Cow Pod at gmail.com. Check out everything that we've got going on. Um, we've got. Uh, around the world is uh, still dropping. I think uh, we are. I have. I think this week just dropped our review of uh, Ernest Goes to Jail. 
So if you haven't already, check that out on both the podcast feed and YouTube. It'll be available in both places. Um, and uh, yeah, fun, fun stuff. Check out the Patreon, patreon.com slash the flying cow. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, Lauren, I'll go to you. Um, what do you got going on? Uh, I got, uh, you can find me on Twitter at Lauren Collins. Uh, again, if you're in the Atlanta area for the next few weeks, uh, I am in Lend Me a Tenor at Act 3 in, Productions in Sandy Springs from March 15th through March 30th. It's a very, very funny farce, like a, like a good episode of Frasier, honestly. Yeah. Um, yes. Lend Me a Tenor, not to be confused with Sell Me a Tenor. Completely different stories. Yes. <laughs> All right, uh, Amanda. All right. Well, you can find me on socials at Amanda Van Heil. And you can also, if you are in Boston, the 21st through the 24th at PAX East, I will be hosting two Legend of Zelda panels. The one on the 21st is, I want to say it's at 6 or 6.30, which is on a Thursday, but it's going to be streamed so you can watch it from home from wherever you are. I believe it's going to be on like the PAX 2 channel. Um, that's going to be a Legend of Zelda 2D versus 3D showdown. And then on the 22nd yeah. is going to be Tears of the Kingdom. I hear you say the PAX 2 channel. It's like, I'm not familiar with these streaming channels. PAX reminds me of the old uh, uh, Christian Broadcasting Network. I was about to say, uh, yeah, the, pa the PAX Network, yeah. PAX, PAX TV. So, yeah, yeah it's like, PAX that TV. seems like a strange venue for a Legend of Zelda series. But, uh, sure. No, the, 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 the Christians, are. they're really into, into Link and Zelda. Yeah. I mean, yeah. <laughs> in the original Legend of Zelda, Link had a cross on his, sh on his shield, and he was supposed to have a Bible. He's yeah, a Christian. Yeah. Mm -hmm. He he was supposed to have a Bible He's early a Christian. on. That that that's that honestly right. is fascinating. <laughs> yeah, that's great. Um, but yeah, we will be back next time. This time, actually reviewing Zuko alone. I promise. <laughs> I promise this time. Um, but yes, until that time, move. Mm-hmm.